The murder of Veronica Gearn prompted an unprecedented outpouring of anger and anguish. There had never been such a depth of public feeling about a murder since the foundation of the state. Politicians, judges, prosecutors, and civil servants were all justified in believing that they could be next. The murder symbolized the sentiment of a nation reeling from the shock of what was the equivalent of a criminal coup. The murder changed everything. It was hard not to be personally affected. I knew Veronica Gearn, but I also knew her killers. For me, this was no longer business. Now, it was personal. Jesus, I, 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 I normally good for words, but I'm not very good at the moment. I just don't know what to say. All I can say about these guys is they're a bunch of merciless bastards. Veronica was, uh, myself and Veronica were very close in the business in the sense that we were mm -hmm. rivals. We were, we, we, we slagged each other. We were in competition together, oh Jesus, when I think of it, and it's one of the, the heartbreaking things that I've been thinking about all night was that the last time I talked to her, she was warning me to watch myself, and every time I met her, she'd warn me to watch myself. She was like a big mother hen to me, so she'd say, Jesus, you know, there's loads of fellas out there like to kill you, you know. I'm talking this morning, you know, she's not. It's absolutely, but, you know, words just can't describe it. The pain that everybody feels now. When I came out from the church, um, being terribly upset, I mean, I found the funeral very harrowing and the whole thing was just, everybody was upset. And a man shouted at me and um, rudely using bad language and said, what the so-and-so are you here for? And it's your fault, she's dead. He was actually physically moving towards me and I'd say would have actually physically attacked me if, if somebody hadn't protected me from that. There was a feeling amongst the general public that organized crime had uh, gone out of control, that there was an evil from within society which actually believed that uh, they had become untouchable, that they could, for example, uh, hire an assassin and stay at arm's length from a murder. I still have a very clear memory of the steward in the government jet coming down and saying that Veronica Guerin had been murdered and what that meant, and the sense of a democratic state being under siege by ruthless people, absolutely ruthless. But I'll always remember at that same funeral how Bernie, Veronica's mother, and Veronica's aunts spoke to me and um, hugged me and said, look, we don't blame you, we know it's not your fault, um, and don't, you know, don't, don't let them get you down. Continue the fight, you know, continue on, continue Veronica's work, but continue the fight that you have to do as a minister and attack these people that have killed Veronica. Nobody is untouchable, and the government is absolutely determined that whoever ordered this murder will sooner or later, and I hope sooner, face charges in our courts. Few doubted the Taoiseach John Bruton's sincerity, but there was widespread public scepticism about the capacity of the state to deliver on his promise. The monsters behind organized crime were getting away with murder. Now the public demanded vengeance. Existing laws had failed to stem organized crime. Now the politicians were being put to the test. But had they the guts and the guile to hurt the godfathers? There's no doubt about it. There was uh, a certain amount of opposition to strengthening our laws uh, from our partners. Well, from our partners in government, from the Labour, uh, Labour Party and from the Democratic left. You know, worried, fears about human rights, civil rights. Everybody realised that to follow up on organised crime You've got to follow the money. You've got to get that and where it really hurts. And not have the day in relation to organised crime that if you got away with the cash in your pocket and you cleaned it in some way, that you couldn't be touched. That day had to come to an end. I knew I had to take this moment to get through tougher legislation. And that is where the Criminal Assets Bureau came from and why we were able to do it then, because there was more understanding all through the government and through Leinster House that things had to be done. I believed that I had the legislation 
which would deal with the threat which presented itself from organized crime and bring under the spotlight of the High Court of uh, this country the people who believe that they can, with impunity, go out onto the streets of this country uh, and murder uh, a young mother. It would mean that people who have lavish, ostentatious lifestyles at the present time without any visible means of income would find their assets frozen by the High Court. And I suggested, well, we could bring in an agency that could um, seize the assets, criminally, illegally procured assets, uh, cash and property and the rest of it, and a few other things. So when the Taoiseach, John Bruton, came in and stood up in the order of business, in response to the various questions that were put to him by the Fianna Fáil opposition, he announced, he committed the government to actually introducing what became the Criminal Assets Bureau. Our bill, our bill, or your bill, Tisha. But let us do that next week. And let us freeze the assets of the drug barons who are known to us all and freeze them once and for all. You know, when the doll comes together, when it's galvanized by an event such as the murder of a respected and courageous journalist. We'll respond to the challenge. Here we were, working together as elected representatives, as office holders in a republic on behalf of the citizens. And you know, when we pull together like that, we can work very effectively. And six, seven pieces of legislation were signed off within nearly as many days. But there was a good will there to make it happen. And there was the recognition that if if we had got it wrong legislatively, well, we'd come back and we'd fix it. We weren't going to sit around and say, we're going to make this legislation 100% perfect before we move. We didn't have that option. We had to move very quickly. The guards were obviously very angry at times that revenue wouldn't assist them in trying to catch some of these people. They knew what income they were getting in. Social welfare knew they were claiming social welfare and yet they seemed to be living very well and they were clearly robbing left, right and centre. And yet somehow they couldn't be got. Those engaged in criminal activity didn't regard themselves as, as part of the system. Their activities were well under the radar and they, they wouldn't be uh, activities that we would have been coming across in the normal course of events, in, certainly in terms of taxation. Revenue couldn't allow us to see their records because of their legislation. And they were bound by legislation as well. Social welfare in the same boat. Customs uh, uh, would have difficulties in that area as well. So it's all right saying, oh, work together. But if the legislation isn't there to facilitate this working together and the political will for it to happen, you're going to have difficulties. The Al Capone example would be thrown up. Over 10 years I heard people talking about why can't we get these people like Al Capone was got for not paying his taxes. But there was a resistance. There was a resistance that it was like Big Brother, you know. Why should social welfare tell finance who's on social welfare? And why should finance tell the Gardaí who's got lots of money uh, and they've no visible means of, of earning it? Two days after the murder, a secret meeting took place here at the Department of Justice in Stevens Green in Dublin. Senior Gardaí, government ministers and top civil servants all gathered to plot the fight back. This was no time for bureaucracy or red tape. I sat on one side of Mr. Frank Dunn was his name, the Assistant Secretary, and Nora sat on the other side and she said her few words of encouragement and I reinforced that. And then Mr. Dunn thanked us um, and proceeded to sort of say, we will now commence our work. And if we come to the conclusion that a special agency is required, uh, then we will move in that direction. And, and something happened to me that has never happened before with a civil servant. I just exploded. I literally just exploded. I could still feel the death of Veronica Guerin and all the other things. And I just intervened, cut across and said, for fuck's sake, I said, excuse me, you are going to come to that conclusion. That's a decision that has already been fucking made. Now, if you're not happy with that, we'll get somebody else to chair this committee because we're not stopping for second thoughts on this one. And I was there as well and I said the same thing, probably not quite as, as richly. The Gardaí, the Revenue Commissioners, were under no illusion at all that the two ministers involved were going to make this body work and were going to make it happen. We were also conscious that it involved social welfare, it involved a number of departments to cooperate and obviously those discussions started immediately as well there was a realisation that this had to move on very, very quickly. That is, all agency forced to work together, whether we liked it or not. Forced to provide information to each other, 
forced to give access to uh, records and hence the urgency that went into it to force all of us to work together and to create a bureau or an agency or a unit that would chase the money, the acquisition of wealth of these people involved in, in this type of crime. This unnamed agency was entering completely uncharted waters. Its leadership would require courage and a lot of flair. By the summer of 1996, the new multi-agency body was in place to go after the loot of organized crime. This was the first time an agency like this had been established anywhere in the world. There was no template to follow, and there was no one to ask how it was done. Cab's success or failure now depended on who was tasked with getting it off the ground. It was one thing to have an agency, but who are we going to get to drive this? Because it needed someone with, you know, commitment and also someone who was going to be aware of the danger which he was putting himself or herself in such a place. Welcome back. One man with a track record for taking on the hoods was now being talked about in the corridors of power. I mean, there, there are more ways than one of dealing with this problem. Um, these people have huge means, very high lifestyle. Um, they're laundering money throughout legitimate business in Ireland. And the most obvious way of catching them is under the existing tax code. They can be caught now if, if the right thing was done. Well, My wife Liz had seen Barry Galvin on The Late Late Show in 1992. Where did you get the but money? he was raving about him. He was dynamic. He knew exactly what needed to be done. He had the chutzpah, so to speak, to, to do it. And, you know, really made a big, big impression. And obviously I'd find that in the back of my mind because uh, his name was the one that surfaced. Are you in any danger for talking like this? Would these boys sort of find you a little objectionable, perhaps? Every so often, uh, I, as, as state solicitor, I would get threats and you'd have police protection in the house for a couple of weeks and then they'd go away again. I always thought we'd have great difficulty in getting somebody. But uh, when Barry Gadwin was mentioned, uh, I smiled because I, uh, it was quite obvious to me uh, that Barry was, 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 the, was the real man for this. I didn't know Barry personally, but I knew him by reputation. And um, I mentioned his name to my father, who was a former superintendent in, in Cork City and had many a tussle with Barry in the court. And I said, what do you think of Barry Galvin? And he said to me, uh, you couldn't get one better, he said. The man the state turned to was the same man the state had ridiculed, Barry Galvin. Galvin's late, late show expose of the weakness of the state in fighting drug trafficking had annoyed P. Flynn. So the justice minister decided to shoot the messenger and dismiss Galvin as nothing more than a Fuine Gael crank out to make a name for himself. Barry was the state solicitor in Cork, had been fighting a battle for years. A difficult battle, it wasn't always respected for what he was doing and in fact I think at times was very ostracised for the work he was doing. But he was working closely with some very senior Gardaí in Cork, recognising that drugs were being brought in along the, the, the isolated coasts of Cork and recognising that um, you had to get at these people through their pockets, through their finances. And so he was ready made for us. I can remember the first time meeting Barry Galvin uh, in my office in the Department of Finance. I'd asked Hugh Coveney, who was the junior minister, uh, to talk to me beforehand. He knew Barry very, very well. And he said, this guy's a mad daredevil. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he's into the most dangerous bloody sports you could possibly imagine, like power hang gliding or um, motorboat racing, you know, jumping from one lake to another, whatever. He was an absolute daredevil. And I said, maybe this is the guy you need. When I arrived at the Department of Finance, uh, Rory Quinn was there, and also the junior minister for finance at the time, Hugh Coveney, a Corkman, who was uh, an old friend of mine for many years. They obviously had possession of a document I had written some years ago about taking the wealth away from drug traffickers through tax and, and also uh, setting up a dedicated agency. And they had taken a version of that 
and had produced a, a draft legislation. The new agency was to be built not only on the application of the tax laws to people who had got money from crime, but also now this new concept of civil confiscation. That's to say, the ability for the state to freeze property without moving to a criminal conviction. He also had a fantastic mind, because when he looked at the draft legislation that we had, and we said, look, this is where we are at the moment, you take it away and look at it and feel free to make whatever any comments because nobody in this department has ever done anything like this before. He came back within days and rubbished some of the stuff and strengthened an awful lot of the others and made it a much, much better bill. Barry Galvin, the legal officer uh, from Cork, who was state solicitor there, it was a man who, in particular, put his neck on the line because, after all, he was a civilian uh, coming from a family life who had never been a policeman and who wasn't part of the security machinery of the state, and yet who was willing to take on this really onerous and difficult position. Barry Galvin wanted to maximise the cab's powers. He wanted warrants to enable officers to search legal and accountancy firms and target banks. In fact, he wanted the power to go wherever the money trail led. In order for the Criminal Assets Bureau to do its work, it needed to be able to get a warrant to search for evidence of the proceeds of crime, anywhere it might be found. And also, the warrant needed to be a powerful warrant that not only did you need to have the authority to search a particular place, but you needed to have the authority to search any person found on the place. Now, I ran into huge opposition in the Attorney General's office uh, over that concept. By the time the Criminal Assets Bureau was up and running, Barry Galvin ensured it had the power to go where no law enforcement agency had gone before, into the offices of lawyers and accountants. In a nutshell, cab could go anywhere in pursuit of dirty money. At the time, uh, it really was a shock horror that you would have guards and taxmen searching a solicitor's office involuntarily, or indeed a bank or an accountant or a stockbroker uh, or any of the professions. But it's now become common case, and people take the view that if the professional by any chance is implicated with the criminal activity, then there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't suffer a search. And secondly, that if they're not implicated, it means that they were unwittingly used by criminals and they should welcome uh, the forces of law and order solving the crime and vindicating them. The government might have been confident that Barry Galvin was the man for the job, but the guard at top brass were not so sure that the job was for Barry Galvin. Pat Byrne, the, the newly appointed commissioner, relatively newly appointed commissioner, rang me uh, on my private phone and asked, could he come and see me? And I always got on well with Pat. And I said, certainly. He said, look, I have some problems about the control and ownership of this agency. He said, it's not that the guards want to necessarily dominate it or control it, but if this thing is not seen to be run by the guards with all of the full support and authority that the guards have amongst the criminal classes, then it's not going to be successful, in his opinion. My strong insistence, at the end of the day, it's a government decision. I give my viewpoint, and I always gave it honestly, was that a member of the Garda Shikana should leave. Because at the end of the day, it would come down to this. Criminality would try and seize on all the weaknesses. The one thing they wouldn't take on, and must never be allowed to take on, and must, in a way, have a certain respect, if not fear for, the Garda Shikana. He said, well, we have to have a guard in the number one slot. And I understand, he said, that you're thinking of possibly Barry Galvin. I said, yes, but because we also need Barry Galvin to drive it. I can't think of any other person who could drive it in the same way. So we worked out a compromise. Barry became the chief legal officer. And um, the guards then were going to have their chief executive officer who was going to run it. And Papern was visibly relaxed with that. Just four weeks after the murder of Veronica Guerin, the Criminal Assets Bureau came into being. Now it fell to Garda Commissioner Pat Bourne to pick his team to get the job done. This unit, the Criminal Assets Bureau, was going to be as good as the people who ran it, who led it, who managed it. Everybody would be looking at it. All you needed in the early days was one slip, one mistake, and all of a sudden it would be debunked. <laughs> 
So I selected two people. I selected Faulkner Murphy as the chief bureau officer, a person I knew from past uh, experience, uh, with a huge background in uh, investigating crime, a particular expertise in white collar crime and assets and all that side of it. Faulkner Murphy was the first director of the Criminal Assets Bureau. He, quite simply, was one of the finest uh, policemen in the history of the state and a brave man. Number two was Felix McKenna, uh, a man who joined the Guard of Chicago around the same time as myself, a man who would have been uh, on the cold face in terms of dealing with organised crime on the ground, uh, tenacious, strong, uh, forceful, afraid of nothing. Huge reputation in investigating crime and it bring that to this new unit, which it needed. I was satisfied at the time. This was our opportunity now to go after all the wealth that was being openly displayed in Ireland, which I knew on a personal level had been generated from criminal activity. I had that personal knowledge from my own investigation of serious crime and the, how I had seen some major crime bosses evolve and become Mr. Biggs. Here you had three people, Faulkner Murphy leading it, Felix McKenna, his deputy, uh, and Barry Galvin, all different personalities. But my God, I, I, they as a team, did they work well together? As commissioner, I felt very, very comfortable with them leading the Criminal Assets Bureau. The nucleus of the individuals that we brought to the, the Bureau at the time came from the Guard of Fraud Squad, who were highly trained and highly skilled in uh, complex investigations. The Department of Social Welfare, Customs and Excise and the Revenue Commissioners sent some of their best investigators to the new agency. But there was a proviso. Their identities had to remain secret. One of the issues from a revenue perspective that we had to address was the security of our own people and how we could produce uh, a framework within which they could feel secure and confident that they could carry out their work without fear of intimidation. And the answer that we came up with in relation to that was, of course, the question of anonymity, providing uh, for circumstances where the officers could carry out their work, raise their assessments, appear indeed in the courts under the, the cloak of anonymity, uh, where they didn't have to reveal their identities and uh, perhaps become the subject of intimidation. This was a, a cornerstone uh, to the setting of the Criminal Assets Bureau. They staff, the personnel that were there, they were just so engaged in their work. They were clearly hand-picked. Both the Social Welfare Revenue and the Gardaí were hand-picked people who were not afraid, had great courage because it was a dangerous job they were doing. They were really cutting at the heart of this snake in our society and they needed a lot of courage to do it. Everyone was a lawyer. Everyone was a guard, everyone was a tax inspector, and no one was in any way resentful about demarcation or people saying what they should do. And there was no resentment about whether it should be a tax case or there was no glory hunting or any of that. That was just not part of the spirit of the Bureau. You know your mission. Your mission is gonna be very simple. Focus on the assets and profits of organized crime and attack the profits of organized crime. Therefore, create an air of decapitation off the underworld. Now for the first time, criminals had to actually explain where they got their cash and their property. And if they couldn't, then the Criminal Assets Bureau could take it away from them. And this is Harcourt Square, where it all started back in 1996. Two floors of this building were taken over by the Bureau. The Bureau was staffed by guards, customs men, taxmen, and is supported then by forensic accountants and administration staff. The purpose of the Criminal Assets Bureau was to deal with criminals who had got wealthy on the proceeds of crime. We were tasked with purely focusing on the assets. So therefore we did not require the in-depth investigation you would have in a complex money laundering investigation for argument's sake, or a complex fraud or a murder investigation. We didn't require all of that detail. We had to then, shall we say, train our minds to think criminal assets and criminality. They were the two essentials. The first thing you had to have was assets, obviously. And then there had to be a reasonable suspicion that whatever asset you were looking at was the proceeds of crime on the civil standard of proof.
Before the Criminal Assets Bureau was established, the state had to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that a gangster's wealth was the fruit of his crimes. However, after the Bureau was set up, an officer merely had to state in court that the assets he had identified were more than likely the proceeds of crime. The onus was now on the criminal to prove that his treasure trove was legitimate. I remember a time when I would go into an interview room, ask a criminal where he had got uh, monies or monies to buy property, and he had the right to silence um, as part of the criminal investigation. I come into the criminal assets bureau and I am now faced with dealing with a civil proof uh, balance of probabilities. It was a culture shock to me and it was something that I had to, to adapt to. It enabled a senior police officer of Chief Superintendent rank to form a belief based on reasonable grounds and to give that belief in evidence, orally or in affidavit, to a High Court judge that a particular dwelling house was the proceeds of crime. No longer could the criminal exercise his right to silence because if he did, uh, as to where his assets were, he knew that the criminal assets bureau were going to come along and take an action against him before the courts. And unless he could show us uh, where he had got the money from a legitimate source, he was in trouble. The mission of the new Bureau was not to gather evidence or establish criminal guilt. It was to trace the origins of dirty money. Cab scenario was totally different from normal policing. This was new. Many, many times I said, we're not concerned about the individual. Concentrate purely on assets. They're expensive cars. They're racehorses. They're hidden bank accounts. They're dwelling houses. Anything of profit that we've found belonged to them. The management of the Bureau, in consultation with all of the other agencies, identified uh, suitable targets. In other words, the, the people who the guards and the revenue and the customs believe, and, and indeed the social welfare who had good information, believed were the people who had benefited most from the proceeds of crime and who should uh, feel the hot breath of cab on the backs of their necks. The public too played a role in the early investigations of the Criminal Assets Bureau. Often letters and phone calls would prompt an inquiry. Concerned citizen report would arrive in addressed to the Bureau, sometimes anonymously, and very often not anonymously, to say that uh, X uh, was living in their estate, that he was known to be a drug trafficker, he was uh, splashing money around the place, and what are we going to do about it? First of all, an inquiry be made by the tax men and the social welfare men as part of the preliminary to know was he in gainful employment and had he by any chance uh, earned the kind of wealth which he was now showing. At the same time then, inquiries were made by the Garda personnel checking out his criminal record. The results of that were then put together and if the person fulfilled the criteria, he was then taken on as a full target. The Bureau could strike at the heart of the underworld's finances in two ways. They could go to court and freeze property or bank accounts. Or they could assess a criminal's wealth and hit him with a very large tax demand. The tax option represents a quicker solution in that uh, the assessments are raised and the, the opportunity to collect the money sits and resides within the Bureau itself. So they both assess the tax liability and then they proceed and set about collecting it. Criminals who had robbed millions and had never been caught now found themselves receiving very large tax demands from the Criminal Assets Bureau based on those ill-gotten gains. In the beginning, because there was no perception among criminals that they were at any way at risk by having big houses or big money in bank accounts or flashy cars, they were in fact careless about the way they conducted their affairs. They openly had bank accounts and they had bank accounts in their own name. And I've often said it, you must think like the opposition. You must think like the enemy. 
if you're dealing with organized crime and you're going to pursue a particular strategy, you must first of all figure out what will that person do to counter the strategy. You must put yourself in the place of the other person. It's like a game of chess. You've got to think about five or six moves or ten moves down the line. The main purpose of the Bureau was to create this fear within the underworld. Yes, you can generate a lot of profits, but there is a tool in the law enforcement system which will uh, eliminate all your profits. This was something the underworld never contemplated, that their properties would be seized and taken off them. You could be successful in crime and you could enjoy the fruits of your success. You could drive a Jaguar or a Rolls Royce. You could own houses, equestrian centres, blocks of flats with impunity. Now, all of that was wiped out. There is now no criminal in Ireland who can enjoy the fruits of his labour in Ireland. Now, gangsters read newspapers too, and they were spooked by the media spotlight on this new cab. All across the country, gangsters raced to empty their bank accounts. On top of the queue were the big players. George the Penguin Mitchell planned to close his accounts and move his multi-million drug trafficking operation to Holland. Jerry the Monk Hutch was not far behind him. Ireland's most successful robber started to empty what he could and put it offshore. John Gilligan and his gang, the prime suspects for the murder of Veronica Gearn, also tried to move their nest eggs to safer havens. These people had reached a level of arrogance, uh, affluence, that uh, when the penny began to drop in relation to what was happening, what happens? People leave the country, people try and hide assets, and all of a sudden you realize we're making progress. Things are happening. When you're dealing with people's assets, the minute they know that you know, you have to get into court quickly, otherwise the assets will be gone far beyond your reach. The clock was ticking against us in respect of the efforts they were making to extract all their monies from the financial institutions and get it out of the country. Now it was time to move. Teams were set up to go after Gilligan, Jerry Hutch and George Mitchell. But the first player to fall foul of the new cab was a former St. Patrick's athletic star, Derek Maradona Dunn. By day, Derek Maradona Dunn seemed a model inner city citizen. He lined out for St. Patrick's Athletic under manager Brian Kerr and seemed to be an honest to God footballer. Here's the corner. Derek Dunn, Costello underneath it and taking it at the second attempt. But off the pitch, there was a sinister side to the local hero. He peddled heroin to his neighbor's children and destroyed their lives all the while salting away his drug money. He's a very major supplier of heroin to Dublin. He's part of a syndicate of relatively young drug dealers who came up in the past 10 years. Derek Dunn had been the target of repeated guard investigations into heroin dealing in the inner city, but Maradona had proved an elusive prey and had managed to stay one step away from the actual product. Several of his mules and street dealers had been nabbed, but he had escaped the net. Heroin dealer Derek Dunn was connected. He was living with George Mitchell's daughter in Amsterdam, where the Penguin had moved his entire drug operation since 1996. After beating a drugs rap in Liverpool, Maradona thought he was in the clear. Sometime prior to the formation of the, of the Bureau, Derek Dunn had stood a trial in Liverpool for conspiracy to traffic in drugs, where he had been arrested after a lengthy surveillance operation. In that trial, he was found not guilty. The customs officers in charge of the case identified a bank account in Dublin, which uh, Derek Dunn controlled. This information was relayed to the Bureau. Maradona went to Miami to celebrate beating the drugs rap in Liverpool. When he got back to Ireland, he decided to close his Dublin bank account and make off with over 50,000 pounds. It was now or never for the Bureau to act. 
about four o'clock one afternoon, we got a call from the bank manager to say that he's here and he wants his money. So the bank manager instructed to give him out a thousand and uh, to come back the following day for the money. We stayed up all night preparing the writs and the affidavits. We got a judge early the following morning. And again, it was a memorable occasion because it was explained to the judge that this was the first application under the new proceeds of crime legislation uh, regarding uh, depriving drug traffickers and organized crime gangs of their uh, financial wealth. Although the Bureau knew that Derek Dunn was one of the biggest heroin suppliers in Dublin, he had never been convicted of any crime. Technically, he was clean and had no reason to believe his money was vulnerable to a challenge from the Criminal Assets Bureau. It was the first time that the Bureau initiated a case in the High Court. The obvious questions were asked, what was he convicted of? Has he been arrested? What are you saying he's guilty of? And I can still remember the then President of the High Court, Declan Costello, looking down at our counsel, Shane Murphy, and said, ah, drug trafficking, I presume this man has been convicted. And our counsel said, uh, no, my lad. Uh, his trial is pending then, he's been charged. Uh, no, my lad. What is the position? He's been acquitted in England, my lord. Whereupon Declan Costell, to his eternal credit, uh, picked up the proceeds of Crime Act that he had in front of him and said, I think I'll take 10 minutes to read the legislation. So the judge adjourned the case to read the Proceeds of Crime Act? There was a huge anticipation of the officers from the Bureau at the time because it was our initial case. I was there personally myself, as was the other senior people from the Bureau. It was a great satisfaction and delight to us when the judge came back and said, you have made your case under the civil process, question of probabilities. The money's in the bank account controlled by Derek Dunn is the Proceeds of Crime. Less than 18 hours after the initial tip-off, an urgent fax was sent to the bank. At the same time, a cab squad car raced to the actual premises to serve the court order on the manager. When Mr Justice Costello ordered the seizure of Maradona's funds, the penny finally dropped for Dunn and many of his cronies. They now realised that just because they hadn't been convicted of criminal activities didn't mean their money could not be taken away from them. That actually created a shockwave within the, the heroin dealers of the inner city who started to take immediate action to sell their properties in the north side of Dublin. But fortunately for the Bureau, we were able to get applications into the court in 1987, whereby all of those dwellings were uh, frozen. And if they succeeded in selling one prior to the action, we froze the proceeds before it left the jurisdiction. Of course, it then became clear that the, for the first time to the courts and the general public, that the emphasis of the Criminal Assets Bureau was on civil confiscation, civil cases, low threshold of proof. Now, an order was made on that, and later on that week, Derek Dunn left Ireland and never came back, and, of course, never was able to offer an explanation of where he got the money. Maradona found refuge in Amsterdam, the nerve center of the European narcotics trade. Here, Dunn was taken under the wing of his father-in-law, George Mitchell. Derek soon made up his losses by doing what he did best, selling drugs. It proved to be a high-risk career move. Derek Dunn was to lose a lot more than his drug money. In 2000, he was shot dead here in his Amsterdam home after a row with his partners in crime. Murder, these days, is a major occupational hazard for every drug trafficker. Around 1 a.m. on the morning of June the 3rd, a gang of men called to Dunn's home. His wife, Rachel Mitchell, opened the door, and shortly afterwards, the shooting started. During the brief gun battle, Dunn managed to shoot two of his attackers. Both of them were injured, but survived. However, he was shot in the head and died instantly. The Derek Dunn case blooded cab. Now, after tasting victory, it was time for them to go after the really big players out there. Top of the list was the Gilligan gang. 
They were being sought all over Europe for the murder of Veronica Gearn. Now the Criminal Assets Bureau was on the trail of the fortunes they'd earned from their deadly trade. I never thought the criminals would lie down. I never believed that they would. We were dealing with some of the most evil men in Irish society. Men who couldn't give a fig for other people's rights. Men who would kill at will. Men who, who believed in plying uh, their trade in death in order to make a miserable uh, few bob. And I was right, they didn't lie down. the Gilligan gang had grossed over 25 million pounds. We were stunned at the level of money. It took two people a day to count the money, and they didn't count the fibres because it took too long. We arrested 200 people, and we seized over 100 firearms. Only Hickey's team had got a result. Now it was the turn of the Bureau to make crime pay. Dirty Money, the story of the Criminal Assets Bureau. Next Monday at 10, on 3. So make sure to join us here on 3 next Monday. Paul Williams will be back for more Dirty Money. Stay with us tonight, though, for an in-depth look at today's big news stories. TV3 Nightly News with Vincent Brown is after the break.